nonprofit organization that works to create a more just and resilient food system here in Rhode Island. And we, our network is open. You're welcome to join us um, in many different ways. We have regular meetings about issues like food access, urban land use, uh, food business support, composting, um, intersection of, of food systems and climate change. And you can learn more about how to get involved by visiting our website, which is uh, rifoodcouncil.org and signing up for the monthly newsletter there. Thank you so much for deciding to attend this third part of our Policy for the People series this fall, Farm Bill 101. We are very excited about today's presentation. And before I introduce you to our amazing guest speakers today, I just wanna give you a little bit of information about the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. So as a Food Policy Council, what we do is bring together stakeholders from lots of different food related sectors to look at how our food system is working in the state and to develop recommendations on how to improve it. Since we bring together a lot of cross-discipline uh, groups of stakeholders with different areas of expertise, it, we're enabled to help identify and work to solve problems that bridge different parts of the food system. Problems that may exist between food access and food waste, food processing and climate change and, and other types of interconnected issues. And because our members are, are really diverse in terms of their interests and skills and lived experiences, we really do pay attention to the entire food system. That means this inner circle that includes food production and processing, um, distribution, retail, food access, consumption, and management of food waste. And it also means the yellow words, the outer circle that you see, uh, things that all parts of the food system need, like healthy soil, land access, clean air and water, access to capital, and a supportive policy environment. The last thing I want to share with you is just a few key facts and figures about our state's food system. Um, this data all comes from national data sets, and we really just want to share a, these, this information because we think it shows you why the food system is so essential and important for everyone in our state and why it's critical for us to engage um, on this once every five years opportunity to make the federal farm bill work as well as it can for the state of Rhode Island. So our food sector has $12 billion in economic output each year. It supports over 75,000 jobs. We have over 55,000 acres in farmland that's being farmed by over 1,000 different farmers. We have a, a large uh, wild caught seafood and aquaculture market that's uh, over $100 million a year. And yet we still struggle with hunger. Um, the latest estimates are that one in six households in our state is uh, food insecure at some level. So I wanted to share those key pieces of information with you and we'll be moving on to the main attraction. Now we have two amazing speakers today from two really important organizations, one regional and one national. First, ANISOG, the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group this is a network of over 500 participating organizations and thousands of individuals who are carrying out farm and food systems endeavors across 12 states and Washington, D.C. And their purpose is to harness the power that exists in this regional network to create meaningful change toward a just food system. Um, their goals are set out as cultivating a robust network, embodying and shepherding equity, and advancing regional interests, sustainability, and equity in food policy. So we're joined by Nicole Sugarman, who's the policy manager for NISOG um, and leads NISOG's policy program. Um, so she organizes network participants to engage in federal and state policies that advance sustainable, equitable, and just food systems across the region, the Farm Bill being a big part of that. And second, um, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, this national organization is an alliance of grassroots organizations that advocate for federal policy reform um, to advance sustainability in agriculture and food systems and natural resources, um, as well as rural communities. So their vision is of a safe, nutritious, ample and affordable food supply being produced by a legion of family farmers who make a, a decent living um, while protecting the environment and contributing to the strength and stability of their communities. Their members work together to advance common positions 
and to support small and mid-sized family farms. Um, and so to do this work, they gather input from many different organizations as well as farmers and ranchers um, across the state and develop policy positions. And we'll be hearing about some of those today. And we're joined um, by Lindsay Farrell, who's the grassroots advocacy coordinator with NSAC. And she is an organizer whose work has spanned many different types of work uh, from immigration justice to reproductive health to direct voter contact. And um, she is a person who has uh, learned firsthand how inaccessible fresh food can be to communities of color. Um, guided by personal experience, she is really excited to be part of NSAC to help in center communities and ensure that everyone has access to quality resources. And so I'm going to go on mute. I'm excited to have you all here and uh, happy to pass it off to Nicole to get us started today, I believe. Um, I think <clears throat> Lindsay's actually going to kick us off. Thank you so much for the introduction, Nessa. Yeah, thank you so much, Nessa. And hi, everyone. It's lovely to be sharing this virtual space with you. Um, as Nessa said, I work for NSAC, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. I'm the grassroots advocacy coordinator. Um, and what do we do? We listen to farmers, we turn farmer stories and their needs into policy, and we advocate for them together. Um, so session like sessions like these are part of our work. We want you to feel empowered and informed, and please, if at any point, drop any questions you may have in the chat, um, and we will get back to them later on throughout this uh, presentation. I'm good. For, oh, perfect. So NSAC is a grassroots alliance of 130 plus members, NISOG being one of them, thanks, Nicole, um, and hundreds of more partners and allies from around the country. We work together to improve federal food and farm policy, and we've been in um, operation for about over 30 years now. Um, and as Nessa already told you, uh, NISOG, the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group, um, we're a Northeast regional network. So our region goes up to Maine, down to West Virginia, includes uh, 12 states plus DC. Um, and we work um, through like connection, learning and policy advocacy to catalyze a sustainable and equitable regional food system, as well as uh, contributing to national and federal policy through um, DC players like NSAC. Awesome. So what's on deck today? Um, Y'all know that you're here to talk about the Farm Bill. So we'll go over a brief history of what the Farm Bill actually is, the structure and programs that are within the Farm Bill, um, what's on, in, on deck for 2023 and what to expect in terms of the timeline and process, and how your voice matters and the work that you do um, matters. I know uh, some folks kind of, at least in my personal experience, I've experienced folks who are like, I'm just one person, I'm just one organization. Like what does Rhode Island have to do in the grand scheme of things? Um, and the important part to note here is every single state has a stake in the upcoming Farm Bill. Um, and so I really encourage you all to ask questions. If you're feeling lost at any point, please put any questions in the chat. I really encourage um, an open dialogue here as much as possible. A lot of it is gonna be information that I just kind of spurred out at you, um, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's go into a little bit of the Farm Bill history. Um, it's helpful to start with a little history before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of things. So the Farm Bill today is what we call an omnibus piece of legislation. So what is an omnibus uh, piece of legislation? It's a large multi-part bill that contains lots of programs, lots of policies, and lots of funding. I'll get into its current structure uh, in a little bit, but something interesting to note is that the original Farm Bill, the Farm Bill dates all the way uh, back to the Dust Bowl. So the Farm Bill really is three separate but related bills um, that was enacted in the 1930s as part of FDR's New Deal legislation. It came about as a means to address two concurrent problems, one being rock bottom prices for farmers due to overproduction and extensive hunger and poverty on, on and off farms. Um, every farm bill also sought to tackle catastrophic erosion and soil loss from drought and poor land stewardship. So think back like all the way back to the Dust Bowl. Uh, lack of credit for small farmers, basic rural infrastructure, needs, unfair export and trade policies, and even more. 
Um, these historic origins can still be seen in the outlines of the today's farm bill as well. Um, however, it's important to name that those early farm bills also in many cases, and actually all cases, explicitly excluded farmers of color and communities of color and how their programs were set up and delivered, and it directly contributed to generations of land loss. For example, refusing to give loans or, or denying them program payments, which drove land loss for all the way from um, BIPOC farmers or immigration policies that exploited the labor um, of people of color while excluding them from accessing the land and capital to farm. So that on top of stolen land and labor underpinning our agriculture system um, goes all the way back to the founding of the country. Um, it's also important to note the historical context because we're still navigating it today. Um, you don't need to look hard before you see the many places where racism is built into the structures of our current farm and food policy. Opportunities for us as advocates to shift policies um, like come more and more, and I'm very excited to share these. Um, advocates and farmers have been long working for policy changes to address the structural inequity baked into the federal agriculture and food policy. Um, for example, dedicated funding for groups, including farmers of color, who have faced significant discrimination at the hands of USDA to redress ongoing harm and redesigning programs and policies to work more equitably. So benefits do not disproportionately benefit large farms at the expense of smaller, diversified, sustainable operations. Improving the policies in the Farm Bill is a way to work to address the inequity um, that it came from and uh, advancing more equitable, and it's a way to advance um, more equitable, equitable policies in the future. Sorry, I talk fast. <laughs> so some more historical context. Um, as you all know, <laughs> colonization is real, and um, folks came in and more than stole more than 1.5 billion acres of land from indigenous people. There were treaties in the Homestead Act of 1862 as well, the stolen labor, um, stolen labor is also something that is very important to note in terms of historical grounding. Um, slavery, um, economic benefit to white landowners, uh, failed reconstruction and broken promises to former enslaved people, all very important when we're grounding ourselves in what, how is this relevant to today's farm bill. Um, the New Deal was the very first farm bill and it upheld systemic racism by excluding domestic workers and farm workers in social programs and labor protections, thereby excluding people of color, um, who were also, who, I'm sorry, who were and are overrepresented over in these fields. Um, it also gave power to the local USDA offices who continue to discriminate by restricting access for BIPOC farmers uh, to loans and other services. Um, I use BIPOC a lot to reference Black Indigenous people of color. I just, um, if you hear BIPOC and you're like, what does that mean? Um, it's referencing Black and Indigenous farmers specifically. And then we have the Agri Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, where met many Black sharecroppers were kicked off of their land. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is actually um, data from the 2013 census. Um, which kind of further highlights that these inequities are still very real today. White folks um, have a lot more land than BIPOC communities. Um, as seen in the chart, it's important to note that like they have more land, um, they have more access to land, and they have, um, sorry, I lost my slide. Um, yeah, they, they have more land, um, and it's still it's still very real today. Um, so let's get into the Farm Bill and how it helps and hurts and what we need to address. So the Farm Bill is developed every five years. It spends over $400 billion and it shapes what we eat, what farmers grow, who can access land and capital, health of our natural resources. Um, it contains policies, programs, and funding, everything from rules around who is eligible to farm um, to who can actually get a loan to buy land. Um, to funding for food assistance to, uh, for lower income families. It also reflects deep seated structural inequities and presents an opportunity to drive change. Um, I kind of frame it like this, anyone and everyone you know is impacted by the Farm Bill in some way, shape or form. And that's an opportunity for them to get involved in the work that we are doing. So there was a lot of legislation in the Farm Bill. <laughs> 
um, like a lot, a lot. And I'm trying to make this as digestible as possible and in full transparency. Um, I'm not a policy person. So um, I'm just kind of trying to make this as digestible as possible. Um, almost all of the legislation in the Farm Bill is authorizing language. That means that it contains text that creates or modifies programs. Um, sometimes the language is very specific, but oftentimes it glosses over very certain complexities. But the Farm Bill almost always includes language about how food and how farm and food programs should work, should function, should operate. It also determines how long a program should continue, whether it is permanent or it can expire after a certain number of years. A really important thing to know is that the text will also define how a program is funded. So funding can be either mandatory or discretionary. Um, mandatory funding is um, mandatory funding means that it's guaranteed to be funded every single year, whereas discretion, discretionary funding means that um, it's subject to congressional budgets and appropriations determined year by year. And of course, the Farm Bill often includes language about who can use a program. So this includes eligibility criteria and often definitions of different types of producers or farm practices. Um, and it also contains priority statuses or enhancements for certain types of farmers, like a newer beginning farmer. In the case of grant programs, the Farm Bill also determines the maximum amount that can be awarded to a program, the length of the grant, and other things like whether matching funds are required and any restrictions on administrative expenses or uses of funding. So it's broken down into 12 titles. Um, all of the Farm Bill is authorizing language, and um, it has everything from commodity programs to uh, nutrition and everything in the middle. Each title addresses a specific aspect of farm, food, and rural policy. There are a number, um, their number and composition of the titles varies from Farm Bill to Farm Bill, but generally they contain these 12 titles. Um, I can go through every single one, but I will just highlight that there are a lot. Um, so we have commodities. So the commodities title covers price and income support for the farmers who raise widely produced and traded non-perishable crops like corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, as well as dairy and sugar. Um, this title also usually includes agricultural disaster assistance. The next one is conservation. The conservation title covers programs that help farmers implement natural resources and conservation efforts on working lands like pasture and cropland, as well as land retirement and easement programs. The third title is trade. Um, NSAC doesn't really cover trade that much, but trade is included in um, the actual farm bill piece of legislation itself. The trade title covers food exports, food exports, subsidy programs, and international food aid programs. The next title is nutrition. Um, the nutrition uh, title specifically has most of the funding as we'll see in, in the upcoming graphs. Um, nutrition specifically covers the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, as well as a variety of smaller nutrition programs to help low income Americans afford food for their families. Title five is credit. Um, the credit title covers federal loan programs designed to help farmers access the financial credit via direct loans, as well as loan guarantees and other tools they, all, they need to grow and sustain their farm. Title six is rural development. The rural development title covers programs that help foster rural economic growth through rural businesses and community development, including farm businesses, as well as rural housing and infrastructure. Seven is research extension and related matters. So things like the SAIA program, things like EQIP, um, any type of research program would be housed under um, housed under Title Seven. Um, uh, title Eight is forestry. Forestry, the forestry title covers forest specific conservation programs like uh, um, that help farmers and rural communities be able to be able to be good stewards of forest resources. Title nine is the energy title, and it covers programs that encourage growing and processing crops for biofuel, helps farmers and ranchers and business owners install renewable energy systems on their farms, and supports research related to energy. Ten is horticulture. The horticulture title covers farmer, farmers markets and local food programs, funding for research and infrastructure for fruits, vegetables, and other horticultural crops, and organic farming and certification programs. 
Title 11 is crop insurance. Um, the crop insurance title provides premium subsidies to farmers and subsidies to the private crop insurance companies who provide federal crop insurance to farmers to protect against losses in yield, crop revenue, or whole farm revenue. The title also provides USDA's risk management agency uh, with the authority to research, develop, and modify insurance policies. And the Title 12 is just miscellaneous. So this title is a bit of a catch-all. The current title brings together six advocacy and outreach areas, including beginning socially disadvantaged and veteran farmers and ranchers, as well as agricultural labor safety, work, the agricultural labor safety um, and workforce development and livestock health. I just talked a lot, talked a lot at you. Um, I'm very sorry if it was kind of all over the place and I really encourage you to ask questions in the chat. So um, what is not the Farm Bill? I think it's very important to emphasize that the Farm Bill is not food workers' rights or protections. Uh, workers' rights aren't typically covered in the Farm Bill, as, long with public grain, as well as public land grazing rights, irrigation water rights, food and drug administration, so food safety, regulation of GE and GMO food and products, renewable fuel standards, dietary guidelines, tax issues, school meals, the Women, Infants, and Children Program, some pesticide laws, Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act procurement. Um, another thing to, to note here is that climate change specifically is not in the Farm Bill. There are opportunities. So NSAC currently um, is working on our Farm Bill platform and our Farm Bill priorities, and we are baking in climate smart, um, climate smart strategies uh, to, like, be integrated into equip and to be integrated integrated into research um, and um, everything else. So there there are ways to, to bake our um, our demands uh, into the farm bill. But the hope is that uh, maybe one day we will have a farm bill that actually does include um, climate change. Um, it's also important to note, for example, farm workers' rights and protections fall under the jurisdiction of the House Education and Labor Committee, Committee and Senate Health Education Labor Committee, not Hackensack, or the House Agriculture Committee and the Senate Agriculture Committee. I'm going to do one more slide and then pass it over to Nicole. Um, so this is just a breakdown of, I believe this was the 2018 Farm Bill and how that money was spent. As you can see, like I mentioned, nutrition was about, well, not about, it was over 50% of the most recent farm bill. Um, and kind of, it's a good visual to see how much money goes where um, for within the, the giant omnibus legislation. I will pass it over to Nicole now. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so now we're going to get a little bit into who writes the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is written by first the um, Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry and the House Agricultural Committee. Um, so this is true of all legislation, but there's like different committees in the House and the Senate, and they are responsible for taking kind of the first stab at writing a piece of legislation. Um, and each the each chamber, the House and the Senate, write their own version of the bill, <laughs> um, and it's independent of each other. Um, so there are usually two things happening kind of simultaneously, um, and we have to kind of remain um, aware of what's happening in the House and what's happening in the Senate because they both are doing important work. Um, the uh, process usually kicks off when um, both um, of the committees, the House uh, Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee, host hearings. Um, that has already been happening happening this year, and you may have heard about it. If not, um, keep your eye on the calendar. Either, you know, we'll, we'll give you contact information at the end, but both NISOG and NSAC keep lists and keep um, our folks who are interested in the loop of when these, committees, these committee hearings are happening. Um, but it's a sign that the committee is beginning its farm bill uh, process. They'll host uh, ag hearings where they'll, they'll listen to folks um, share about different issues that are important to them within the realm of the farm bill. Um, both experts and, you know, and grassroots folks um, who are, of course, experts in their own lived experience. Um, the next step is that the House and the Senate Ag Committee um, uh, introduce what's called marker bills. 
Marker bills are like little pieces of legislation that they introduce. They have like names as if they're full bills. And the whole purpose of these marker bills is to kind of demonstrate support for certain issues that they hope will be included in the farm bill later. Um, so there have been a number of marker bills introduced already. You might hear me reference them later. Um, they don't intend for these bills to pass on their own, but they're organizing tools for issues and um, programs that they hope will be considered in the farm bill later on. Um, marker bills are very important. So they, they offer, we'll talk about this later also, but they offer a kind of a hook for us to get involved with our members of Congress and let them know what issues are important to us. If we hear a marker bill that we're excited about, you know, that overlap with your issue, it's um, totally appropriate to call your, your, you know, your representative or your senators and say, look, you know, I heard about this bill, like where does the senator stand on it? Or will you, you know, consider signing on to it? Or like, I, you know, this, this would really be helpful for me and my issues. Um, and yeah, so that's, um, the first step in getting the farm bill written. Um, next slide, please. So this is like, um, I've lived here. I've always. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I just, I heard some background noise. So this is a little graphic of how the farm bill gets written. Um, once the committees have finished their hearings, their tours, their listening session, they draft the farm bill again, independently. Um, and that's this first kind of uh, tier here where the House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee are simultaneously drafting their own uh, versions of the Farm Bill. Um, once they've completed their draft, um, the committees debate what's called markup, which means they like amend the Farm Bill based on you know concerns people um, bring to the, the, the drafts they've written so far. And then they pass it out of committee. Um, the bills then go to the full House and the full Senate, um, where people who are not on the Ag Committee um, can get their chance to uh, debate, amend, vote on, um, and then finally pass out of the full House and the Senate of Representatives. So then they have two separate bills. Often these bills are very different from each other. Um, and then the, um, the a smaller group of senators and representatives called a conference committee come together, look at the two bills and kind of try to reconcile them. So they like, you know, come to a, a, a middle ground um, or like, you know, decide which parts of each bill they want to preserve, which parts they're going to, you know, unfortunately, so, well, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what it is, but which parts they're going to scrap um, and how they're going to make these two bills into one cohesive document. Um, usually the conference committee is made up of members of the House and the Senate Ag Committees. Um, the combined version then goes back to the House and the Senate to be debated and potentially passed. Um, and finally, that bill <laughs> is uh, sent to the president's desk for their signature. Um, so it's like a really involved process. I will be perfectly honest, before I started in the world of federal policy, I had no idea the, po the process was this uh, complex. You know, I didn't know that the, the uh, legislation were um, basically written by a very small group of senators and representatives, and those people are extremely important. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And again, please drop your questions in the chat. We'll have some time to uh, address um, the questions at the end. Um, but let's go to the next slide and talk about, in light of all of this kind of like who does what at what step of the process and how different senators and representatives kind of um, plug in, Let's talk about Rhode Island in the process. Um, so Rhode Island is a state with um, who, where there are no members of Congress on the House or the Senate Ag Committees, but that does not mean that um, the, the legislators from the state cannot um, and do not champion ag issues. Um, as you saw, there is points in the Farm Bill process um, where the entire full House and Representative gets to vote, you know, amend, mark up the different bills. Um, so there are both direct ways for folks to get involved as well as indirect ways, you know, all the um, folks in Congress talk to each other. Um, so if, you know, if someone has a buddy in, who is on the Ag Committee, they could easily say, you know, this, matter, this, this matters to my state, you know, I heard about this issue, like, you know, are, are you, you know, trying to include that in the bill. You can also cultivate champions to uh, request um, a spot on the Ag Committee later, you know, so it's always good to talk to your uh, senators and representatives, let them know this issue matters to them, to you and they can end up as a um, ag committee um, member or a, a or a champion off um, committee. 
Um, a good example is I saw we have uh, Mira on the call from Senator Reed's office. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mira. Um, and Senator Reed is a really good example of someone who has been a real champion for agriculture from off committee, um, as well as serving on the Appropriations Committee, which has critical, um, uh, it, this wasn't covered in the Farm Bill process, but there's a whole nother process where appropriation committees uh, end up making a lot of the really critical funding committees for uh, the Farm Bill later on. Um, so I'm sure there are so many folks here who know your members of Congress quite well, but I've just listed them all out in case you don't. So the senators represent everyone in the state, and then everyone in Rhode Island is represented by either one, either the first district or the second district uh, representatives. Um, and I've included a little bit about kind of their hooks or where they might um, intersect with ag, sustainable ag and equitable ag issues. Um, I just want to note that the second district um, representative will be new uh, in the 2023 uh, year, replacing outgoing um, representative who retired. Um, so that's a great, you know, opportunity to make a new connection, cultivate a new ag champion, introduce yourself because he will be just, you know, just really fresh um, and joining committees for the first time. Okay, so delving a little bit more into the Rhode Island context, um, I took the Rhode Island food policy um, priorities. Um, and if you are not familiar with these, I'm sure you can ask um, someone on the Rhode Island Food Policy Council to share a link to the policy priorities. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that many of you know, you know more about these priorities than I do, but I took a look at the, um, the policy platform. Um, this is Kiwi. Kiwi uh, is my cat who is, been hiding in my lap the whole time. <laughs> um, and I kind of pulled out programs in the Farm Bill that um, fit into each category of the Rhode Island Food Policy Council uh, policy platform. There's a lot of overlap in what can be accomplished through the Farm Bill to benefit Rhode Island ag and food systems. And also the list that I've created here is not at all exhaustive. Like the Farm Bill is just so comprehensive and includes so many programs that I just kind of took like a first stab at it. And I'm sure there are like lots of programs that I just didn't come to mind under each of these policy buckets. Um, so that just gives you a kind of a, a um, an idea of the scale of the farm bill because they're it's just it's just it's just humongous. Like all of these programs that um, we're gonna scroll through make up just like a tiny slither of the farm bill pie. Um, so just go go through these. I'm not gonna like name every program, but like you know, for example, under uh, preserving our farms, which is like a you know a, a policy priority of the Island Food Policy Council. There are some great programs um, about like conservation easement programs. Um, there's an Office of Urban Agriculture in the Farm Bill that was just um, authorized for the first time in 2018. So that's an example of a brand new program that advocates championed um, to get into the Farm Bill. And there is now uh, money and support for urban agriculture included in the farm bill. Um, diverting for food from landfills, there's a composting uh, pilot program that's part of that um, urban agriculture um, office that was created in 2018. Um, next slide. Yeah, um, part of Rhode Island Food Policy Council's uh, platform is ensuring food access. Um, and they're just some really great program. I mean, SNAP aside, which is huge and makes up a big part of the nutrition title, but there are just some really great um, programs on the Farm Bill um, that connect, you know, give vouchers to seniors and vouchers to folks on WIC to shop at farmers markets. So it's supporting the local economy and supporting um, folks who need access to food. Um, there's uh, funding for healthy food cor uh, corner stores, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. There's funding for back to school, farm to school grants, so getting more um, local foods into cafeterias and institutions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and here's an example on this slide. Here's an example. You can write that down, or this will be made available afterwards. But here's an example of a marker bill that um, folks like NISOG and NSAC are supporting. Um, which is the Farmer's Market and Lo Food Bank Local Revitalization Act of 2022. Um, so that's like a marker bill that includes many of these food access priorities. Um, it's a great thing to take a look at if it, um, you know, if it aligns with your organization's priorities. It's something that you could consider uh, reaching out to your member of Congress with and asking them to support it when it is reintroduced in 2023, because that'll be the next step. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and then the last pillar of the Rhode Island Food Policy Council is um, supporting local businesses. So these are just some examples. There's um, 
grants in the Farm Bill for farm storage facilities, um, grants for food safety, uh, like um, farm and farm food businesses learning how to make their uh, or their businesses food safety compliant. Um, the local agriculture market programs has money for you know farmers market direct marketing. It has um, money for farmers to start value added product uh, lines, uh, et cetera. There's just so much in there. And I know that this is extremely brief, um, <laughs> but um, like I said, this uh, slideshow will be made available afterwards. So feel free to like dive into any of these in greater depth. Okay, next slide. So what is coming through in 2023? 2023 is the year, which is why uh, RIFPC decided to do this presentation now is because we're on the cusp of a really important year. I mean, we're already in the middle of the process, but 2023 is the year when hopefully the Farm Bill will be reauthorized. Um, so what's happening now and what will happen kind of in um, the beginning of the year um, is the 118th Congress will begin, including newly elected lawmakers like the new um, representative from Rhode Island. Um, there will be new uh, appointments on the House and Agricultural Senate Committee. I mean, yeah, on the House and Senate Agricultural Committees. Um, so folks can sometimes, uh, often, there are some folks who like to stay on one committee. You know, there are people who have been on the Ag Committees for many years, and there will be some jumping around where people will join other committees. New people will come on to the Ag Committee just based on their interest and based on um, like politics around um, who gets appointed to which committees. Um, so people will reintroduce marker bills. Like I said, those are those little pieces of legislation that um, the legislators use as organizing tools for issues they care about in the Farm Bill. Um, and there will be some that are reintroduced because they have to reintroduce them once a new Congress comes, and there will be some that are new. Um, there will be continued Farm Bill hearings in D.C., um, and the 2023 Farm Bill uh, will begin to be actually written by the House and the Senate Ag Committee. Um, in the spring, the initial drafting will continue. Um, hopefully, uh, at the end of the spring, lawmakers will complete and share their initial drafts um, called the chairman's mark. Um, then there will be committee meetings to discuss and make changes to the mark. Um, and marker bills may be included or uh, par they're partially or fully in the bill. And that's always fun to look for, you know, what issues made it in, what issues are not. Um, but there sometimes is an opportunity to turn additional marker bills that did not make it in that we care about into amendments for markup or future uh, consideration. Yeah, it's a lot. And I'm going through all this. It's not on the text and you don't need to know it, but it's just a good thing to mark because each one of these um, things that is happening is another opportunity for us to have influence in the process. Okay, so if you think of it, you know, in the spring and during the hearings, there's an opportunity for us to weigh in. Um, while the initial draft is being written, there's an opportunity for us to weigh in. After the draft is released, we can weigh in, you know, and let them know what we think of the draft. While it's being um, marked up on the floor, we can weigh in and try to get, you know, additional issues we care about introduced as amendments. So um, throughout the year of 2023, it'll really be game time for us um, to get our voices heard. Um, and by us, I'm including, you know, advocates like Lindsay and I and the organizations we work with and all of you, because really, um, What's most important is for uh, our, our, our Congress people to hear from, from the people they represent and hear from the people on the ground using the programs. Um, so in the fall, in the summer to the fall, um, the Ag Committees will hopefully pass their versions of the Farm Bill out of committee. They'll move to the floor. They'll have floor debate like we saw in that uh, handy dandy diagram. Um, sometimes one chamber moves faster than the others, usually, <laughs> to bring a, a bill through the committee and floor process. Um, so these will happen like probably a little staggered. Um, and then there's a big recess in August where all the lawmakers go home and host in-district events, meetings with stakeholders. There's probably like farm tours um, and it's a good opportunity to meet your uh, legislators back in their home states. Um, in fall, um, we're going to hope that um, both uh, the House and the Senate pass their respective buildings of versions of the bill and a conference committee will form. Um, the conference committee will uh, resolve differences, like I said, um, and then if that happens, it's sent to the president for signature and, or veto. Um, the reason I'm saying hopefully is very often uh, the process does not happen on exactly the time schedule that's uh, set out for it. 
And so you may remember from 2018, there were a series of, extens uh, of extensions of the previous farm bill where they didn't get the new farm bill uh, ready to be passed by the president in time. Um, you know, there are just disagreements, things happen, you know, there's like a lot of stuff that goes on in DC simultaneously. Um, so it ended up the previous farm bill had to get extended um, because the farm bill is a funny piece of legislation that like, um, if it's not, if an extension is not passed, there are like all these different programs that get set down to zero that could create kind of a little bit of chaos in the food system. So it's it's incentive for them to pass a new one on time, but it also means that sometimes the previous bill gets extended until they're ready to get the new one passed. Um, I saw some things in the chat, so let me make sure I just didn't miss anything. Um, yes, as Lindy noted in the chat, um, it's important to note this timeline is not static. So like I said, this is kind of like a best case scenario or how we expect things to go. And we can equally as um, assuredly expect there to be some rearranging of the um, schedule and for things to kind of get shifted around. I was going to add almost guaranteed that things are going to get shifted around. Everything depends on the pace of the new Congress um, and how things go. You know, like COVID is a, a prime example of just life and world events that happen. Um, so everything is just dependent on the new Congress and how the new committee appointments go, how relationships go when you start reaching out to folks. Um, and yeah, hopefully it gets passed and reauthorized September of next year. But again, that is just a, a TBD. Yeah, uh, it, it always, it remains exciting. <laughs> um, so this is the, the most important part is how can we be heard? How can you be heard? How can I be heard? Um, how can we all um, kind of influence the process? Because it may seem overwhelming, you know, it's far away, it's really big, it's a lot of money. And there are very real ways for all of us to get involved. And it is, and, uh, and as a matter of fact, paramount that we do. Um, the three, the kind of a uh, learn, listen, and add your voice are the top line uh, items. Let's go to slide the next slide, please. So, first today we today we uh, did the learning a little bit of learning already. Um, if you're new and just getting started, um, you know, learn who represents you, um, you know, what issues they care about and why. Um, and you can even go ahead and introduce yourself to your representatives. Um, they, you know, they, they, they are elected to, uh, to, you know, represent you in Congress. Um, so they really do like hearing from the folks in their district um, that, you know, they, they, they represent. Um, it's also a good time to start checking out the news and just learning what's going on with the Farm Bill. Um, NSEC has helpfully listed some great news sources here. Um, some of these are paywalled but have some free features. Some of them are not paywalled. Um, but even, even some of the mainstream papers um, will occasionally have uh, Farm Bill coverage if you, know, uh, if you know where to look for it. Um, the next step is listening. Um, so understand what your lawmakers are saying and doing. Um, what are they supporting? What are they opposing? Um, you can sign up all, they all put out uh, newsletters that you can sign up for and in each newsletter, they'll kind of say what uh, issues they've been working on, what pieces of legislation they voted to pass and oppose. Um, following them on Facebook or Twitter um, is a great way to see what's coming out of the offices. Um, and you can also look up on uh, GovTrack US, which is uh, listed here. And again, we'll give out the slideshow. Um, you can. Um, look up what bills they've sponsored, um, look up their voting record, committee lists, uh, et cetera. So yeah, so after you learn who represents you, learn kind of like what they care about, what makes them tick and what kind of uh, issues they're working on and what kind of um, things, uh, legislation they've, they've helped sponsor and push out. Next slide. Um, and then the last thing is speaking up. Um, so lend your voice to campaigns that NSAC um, puts out. Um, NISOG also shares, you know, we, we're not based in D.C., but we do share campaigns from a number of D.C. Um, allies and organizations, you know, who are uh, fighting the good fight for a farm bill uh, equity and sustainability. Um, share your perspective. Um, so um, during those hearings that we've talked about, during the listening sessions, uh, even on the farm tours, you know, the in-district events, um, public comment periods. Um, yeah, let them know what matters to you. It can seem confusing, but you don't need to be a policy expert to uh, to speak up. 
Like you can, you can speak from your values. You can speak from programs that you've used on your farm or your business. Um, you can just say, you know, this helps me. You can say like, I need help with this. You, any kind of any, um, any issues that you um, have experience with are great to, uh, to speak up about. And the last thing is we always um, want to center equity in our work. Um, so I like to think of this as a, pol as a like a, a power analysis. Um, so who is deciding and who is benefiting? And they're both important because sometimes as like a white person, I don't always have the right assessment of who is benefiting. So I always like to look at who's deciding and make sure it's the people most impacted who are both um, supporting the issues at hand and benefiting from their outcome. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I can take the last two slides and I wanted to take an opportunity to also plug a sign up sheet that I have. Um, so in the event that you are interested in signing up for NSAC's weekly roundup or action alerts, you can drop your name in this Google sheet um, and I will reach out to you and make sure that you get put on all of our listservs. So a little bit about those two things. So we have our weekly roundup, which is just the what's happening on the Hill this week. One of our policy fellows, um, or our policy fellow at the moment, kind of puts together a list of hearings. We put together um, where the Farm Bill is at and what to expect coming out of DC and on the Hill. Um, and then we have action alerts. So any grassroots actions that may come up, whether that's endorse NSAC's policy platform, whether that's call your member of Congress, whether that's literally any grassroots action that you can think of, um, they usually get sent through action alerts. So just put in a check next to an X or a check next to um, which one you'd like to sign up for if it's something you're interested in. Another opportunity that um, I thought of just off the top of my head that um, I'd love for you all to sign up for is if you're interested in reaching in me reaching out um, for a one on one, I'd love to chat more about this in depth. I know this is limited time, limited capacity, um, but the farm bill is something that is very important. And if there is any chance that we could connect, I'd absolutely love to. Um, one of our last slides is a let's connect slide where you can find all of our information as well. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, Perfect. Let's connect. <laughs> um, yeah, these this is our email, um, websites, email, um, Facebook, anything, everything you need. Um, I am very glad that we got the chance to chat today. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd love to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole and Lindsay. That was amazing. I'm going to leave this up just for, uh, you know, five or 10 more seconds so folks can jot it down, but also want to note that since we've recorded this session, we will be sending the recording out um, to everybody afterwards. So you will have access to this information. And then I'm going to take us off of the screen share so we can see each other and um, and I have not been keeping track of any questions that came up in the chat, but Allison has. So um, we invite you to uh, put your questions in the chat. And if there are any there, Allison, right now that we can start off with, if you could read those out, it would be great. And um, then after we do that, we'll also welcome folks to just unmute uh, or raise your hand and, uh, and ask questions. So are there any that we should start off with, Allison? Yeah, well, I wanted to highlight some um, some points that Willa has been bringing up in it, quite a long sentence, so I don't think that I ought to read the whole thing, but Willa, I wanted to give you space to speak up if you wanted to. Okay, well, essentially, um, what she's pointing out is just a, a lot of inequities with um, farmers that need assistance transporting their food. So limitations on transportation, limited time for processing, um, and then how that relates to all of our healthcare. Thank you for that, Allison, and thanks for, for bringing that uh, to, the, to the top, uh, Willa, we appreciate it. And um, if there aren't any more questions in the chat right now, please just um, either unmute or raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask Nicole or Lindsay. 
I can start off with one that I'm stealing from our board chair, Diane Lynch, um, which is really just about how this recent election and the fact that there's probably going to be um, a divided a, a divided Congress. Uh, what what are the impacts of that on the farm bill? Does it change the the timeline? Does it change the probability of the passage? Are, is there anything that's made more difficult uh, or easier by the fact that that's probably going to be the case now? Um, I can start, and then I'll let Nicole chime in too. Um, but I think. Um, Yes, the new the the most recent election impacts the farm bill greatly. So with the new Congress comes new committee appointments. So people who are on the House committee at the moment um, that have just been voted out of office are no longer going to be on the House committee. Same with the Senate House Ag Committee as well. Um, so the new election, um, the 118th Congress kind of is a fresh start. And so it's very critical that we take action when we can to start developing those relationships because um, we don't know when those appointments are going to come out, and we don't know when. Um, I, I tend to err on the side of caution, and that is if you know who your new representative is going to be, reach out to them sooner rather than later and start developing that relationship sooner rather than later, um, because this has got to get done. <laughs> Um, and I'll just add, as far as a divided House and Senate, the um, the Ag Committees have really always prided themselves on bipartisanship, so that doesn't mean that the different um, parties in power do not end up with different bills, but it would have been a bipartisan process anyway, and it will continue to be so. Um, so, yeah, it will it will be interesting to see. Obviously, if the outcome had been different, um, we would see a different bill, like different, um, you know, the... Um, I know that, like, for example, the Republicans on the House Ag Committee um, do like to try to cut SNAP benefits a little bit, um, whereas the Democrats are more likely to preserve those benefits. So with uh, a Republican-led uh, House Ag Committee, we might see some cuts or attempted cuts, you know, but that's kind of balanced by the um, different House having power in the Senate. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, and we're likely, as always, to get like a very bipartisan bill just because of the way the um, the Ag Committee's work and the way the um, like the just the the balance of power in the in both chambers. Thanks to both of you that that was that was very enlightening. Um, we do have another question that's come in from Stephen Stikos. Can you please explain the commodities program? How do big farms get all the money? As I have heard. Do you want to take this, Lindsay? I was going to toss it to you, Nicole. I um, so I'm on the grassroots side of NSAC, so I do a lot of like grassroots action and grassroots organizing, and I'm not super familiar with the ins and outs of the programs. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, as a Northeast regional policy person, a lot of my work is kind of um, working with the parts of the farm bill that both do or do not work for Northeast farmers. Um, and the commodity payment, the commodities part is kind of an interesting one. Um. I mean, it's not it's not true that big farmers get all the money, but it is true that the way the commodity payments are set up is for commodity crops, as it says, which are oftentimes crops that are most profitable when they are grown on a large scale. Um, so, for example, corn, you know, uh, soybeans. Um, so here in the Northeast, we tend to have more diversified farms and we tend to have, you know, crops that are like a higher um, yield per acre just because we have smaller, more diversified farms. Um, and a lot of those crops like uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, um, are not included in the commodity title. Like we do not get commodity payments for those crops. So that's just kind of a, a really short synopsis on how that um, that title ends up, uh, um, you know, kind of giving money towards smaller scale, I mean, larger scale farmers. So a lot of what like we try to do is make up for that in other parts of the farm bill where we can get more incentives or money in for you know small regional diversified uh, food and farm systems. Thanks, Nicole. We don't have any other questions in the chat right now, so I'd welcome people uh, raising your hand or up oh, here comes one. Um, Shelby Doggett is asking, do you know how much of the spending in Rhode Island is for turf farming? Um, so I should I should preface that question just by saying that in Rhode Island, I think they're the, our largest you know, sales area when you look at the US Census of Agriculture is landscape and nursery. And that turf makes up a lot of that. A lot of what used to be potato farms in Rhode Island is now um, growing turf for the construction industry. 
I'm not sure if you know the answer to that question, but it is how much of the spending in Rhode Island is for turf farming? I do not. I don't know if anyone on the Food Policy Council knows the answer. Um, and I'm honestly, I don't know if you know, Lindsay, but I'm not sure if um, turf farming is in the farm bill at all. <laughs> um, I can look into it and email people after. It's not a commodity, right? So it wouldn't be eligible for commodity payments. Yeah, I honestly don't think that would um, go into the farm bill. But again, I would need to do some further Googling and research. Right. I mean, I, I would think that some of the some of the funding that might go to turf farms would be if they're engaging in the energy programs, um, the farm bill energy programs. That's that's maybe the clearest one that I can think of. I'll just jump in. I am not an expert on this, but I do think that um, there are a number of programs that turf farms are not eligible for. Um, and that one of the things that are um, uh, that has happened over the years is that uh, our state level um, FSA head and others have tried to lobby to get some parts of turf included in uh, in farm bill programs. So I don't think that we're automatically in it. I think there may be some money that does flow. Thanks, Diane. Any other questions you can put in the chat or just unmute and ask them. If there are no other questions, then what we will do is follow up uh, with this recording that will go out to everyone who participated today and those who, uh, those who, oh, Stephen Stikos has put another question in. What commodities are covered by the commodity program? So, Lindsay, do you have an answer for that one? Nicole, please add, I'm gonna miss some, but I believe corn, soybeans, dairy, sugar, wheat, Mm, Nicole, am I missing any? Maybe soy. Soy, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm just uh, googling it now to make sure that I have them all. That sounds good to to, to me. Um, cotton. Oh, cotton. Yeah, anything that is grown in mass. Yeah, oil seeds. Yeah, there are a couple. We, I, I can drop some. I'm not getting the exact link. Um, this is a good time to mention maybe that uh, NSAC actually has an amazing like um, farm bill primer um, that I'm going to drop in the chat. But there's a whole like, um, where's your, I'm going to drop this in, but there's a more in-depth primer that I'm also looking for that they have on their website that's super helpful. We are also we're also going to be taking our um, launching our platform officially this week. So for the folks that just signed up for the weekly roundup and action alerts, you'll be getting a notification saying, "Hey, this is what we are asking for on the federal level." Um, and if you're interested in getting more involved in NSAC, please reach out. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay and Nicole, both for those additional resources. Um, I can also add that the Rhode Island Food Policy Council does have a working group that's coming together, a small group that's coming together um, that will be meeting um, after this meeting to talk about next steps, which I believe will be including um, outreach and setting meetings with those congressional delegation members. So if you want to stay engaged at a higher level uh, around Farm Bill uh, with that, um, you know, with that group, you can just reach out to me and Allie, maybe you can put my email in the chat so folks can just uh, send me a note or send a note to info at and we will get you added to that group, um, which I said, as I said, meets about once a month and we'll be meeting relatively soon to talk about next steps um, for after this meeting to bring this work forward. So if there aren't any other questions right now, I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. I just want to thank you both again for spending this time with us, Lindsay and Nicole. And um, we and so we thank you so much. We'll stop the recording now. If you also want to just.